Welcome to European Startup Universe Talks. In this series, we will meet startup founders, entrepreneurs, investors and major stakeholders of the startup ecosystem. They will let us in on the challenges and the successes of their career, their view on the current state of the startup field and give vital advice for those in the beginning stages of their startup journey. If you're in the early stages of your startup and are looking for an opportunity to take it to the next level, join the six-week European Startup Universe initiative of your country. There you will get founding opportunities, meet with experienced experts and founders, and network with the startup community and much more. Let's make the EU the global powerhouse for startups. Welcome to European Startup Universe Talks. I'm Maurizza and I'm here today with Pavlos, the CEO of WIRE. Welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, we're happy to have you. I would like to begin with, can you tell me about WIRE? What is it that you, you do? Of course. So uh, WIRE is a startup uh, out of Cyprus. Uh, and what we do is uh, we collect uh, data on the real estate market. Uh, which we combine, we combine basically databases from government, public, uh, publicly available information, and then satellite data. And in this way, what we can do is we, we make a, a representation of the built world uh, around us. So if you think about it, what you have is you have governments having all this data about uh, buildings, roads, uh, electricity cables, etc., which increasingly are, they are making publicly available because of the European Union's open data directive. So we, we take all these government databases and we put them together. We then crawl the internet and we download uh, points of interest, for example, uh, restaurants, uh, bars, parks, uh, blue flat beaches, anything like that. And then we access the European Space Agency's uh, satellites and in this way, we have dynamic data. So for example, uh, we know when somebody starts construction. So the moment somebody starts construction, the satellite will pick it up. Through machine learning, we are informed. So we know that on this parcel of land, somebody has started uh, building something. Uh, similarly, we are able, again, through the satellites to, um, to, uh, have, to develop models and to assess the risk profile of different uh, land parcels or buildings. So to see, for example, if you are in an area where the, there are landslides, which is obviously of importance to insurance companies, to see if you are in an area where there is soil subsidence, so if the, the ground is going down, if you are in an area of flood risk, if there is wildfire risk. So uh, this is what we do. We collect all this data, we standardize and we process it. And then we make it available effectively to three clients, uh, financial institutions uh, who deal with more the price of the assets. So uh, banks, real estate investors, um, and individuals. The second is insurance companies who want to deal with risk. And then the third is companies who want to do some form of market research, who come to us to ask questions of the type, where is new construction happening? Where are new houses being built? Uh, so that we know where to, for example, go and uh, buy land or to build a supermarket, right? Uh, and we do that for all properties. Right? This, is, this is the unique thing about the way we do that. We cover uh, the entire country uh, rather than just do a market research or a study in a very specific area. Okay. How did you come up with that idea? Um, so... In uh, my background and the team's background is in uh, real estate. Uh, we were involved, um, you know, in the good days until uh, 2009, 2010, uh, before the global financial crisis hit. Uh, we were working more doing uh, valuation work and real estate agency. Um, but then, uh, unfortunately, as the crisis uh, started, um, first in Ireland and then uh, across uh, Europe, uh, we were increasingly forced to focus on uh, managing distressed real estate and non-performing loans. Obviously, a problem that is uh, mainly in the south or was in the south of Europe more than anything else. Um, so that experience over the last 10 years, uh, working with banks and uh, investors who were buying portfolios of loans and portfol portfolios of real estate, made us realize that uh, there has to be a way to understand what the property is in a, in a simpler way 
than uh, the manual work that was being done. So <clears throat> just to explain what you have, for example, if you are a bank, you would, you would give a loan to someone. And then at the same time, you would keep a separate record about what the value of the property is and some of these characteristics. Every three years or whatever number of years, you need that value updated. You need the, the, what, how much is the asset worth updated? You would send actually somebody out there to collect pretty much the same information about that property and give you the new value of the property. Similarly, if you're an insurance company and you wanted to insure that property, you would also go out and collect again the same information about the property. So again, build it where, where it is, building size, age, and whatever, uh, to, and, and, and then see the risk side. You know, what is the likelihood of something going wrong with that property? Because that's what you're insuring. So being in that position for 10 years, we realized that what was happening is that you had different databases within banks, within insurance companies, and everywhere else that are basically um, asking or seeking the same information or 70% of the information is overlapping between all of these organizations. So what we can say is, okay, instead of having all these different users going out and finding the information and basically doing the same job two and three times, we will create uh, a copy uh, of everything. And each one of them can come to us and take the part that they want. That's it. So that, that was the idea. The idea was to make it was to improve transparency for everyone and make uh, life more efficient for these organizations. And then on the back of that, add to the transparency of the real estate market, because it, it allows us if you collect all this information, you are able to develop different financial products and services on the back of this database and the various APIs that we have set up. Okay. Oh, well, that's very interesting. And it's very much a good thing to have some sort of overview of what's really going on in this complex yeah. area. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, and, it, and it's part of the driver also of the EU. I mean, the EU, you know, uh, had many good and many, very bad things in, in many ways. The one thing that it has going for it is that this openness and, uh, you know, this idea that uh, government in general should. I mean, I would say that the EU in general is more pro-government and being, you know, uh, government being more involved in how lives are run. But at the same time, there is this push about data and the data being open uh, for everyone. Uh, you know, this open data directive, which started uh, more than 10, 15 years ago, combined with uh, what is called the Inspire Directive, is forcing all governments to put the data out there. Satellites have become and are increasingly becoming more and more available in terms of accessibility and lower cost. So, you know, the idea is to combine this and give everybody access to, to what is happening in the real estate market. How, how was the process of uh, putting together the team? Um, look, the, we are now, so we started trading or uh, the, I think the fancy word is called uh, ideation. Uh, so that was uh, in September 2020, so a year and a half ago. Uh, and basically, we were colleagues who had worked together before uh, in the previous company, as usually is the case. Um, with uh, So we are three co-founders. Uh, my co-founder, Nikki, uh, we've worked together for the last uh, six years. She, she's a very you know, dynamic person who has a uh, finance background that is more into numbers. Uh, my other colleague, Andreas, we actually worked together since 2008. So we've known each other. Uh, we know each other quite well. He's more on the real estate side of things and, uh, you know, how you manage real estate, different data that you need and so on and so forth. So uh, there is this uh, trust element, let's say, uh, that uh, we had between us. Um, so, you know, this is, uh, these are the three key members of the team. From that point on, hiring people as a startup is, uh, is very hard. Um, you don't have money to pay. So, uh, you know, you're competing. Uh, it's a lost cause, so basically try to compete on money. So what you're trying to do is uh, you're trying to find people who sort of buy into what you're doing, uh, or if you get lucky, uh, people who, um, let's say, they've lost their way a bit. Maybe they're, doing a, they're, maybe they're taking a career break. Maybe they are... Uh, you know, between jobs and you can grab them for a little bit of time to, to serve uh, your purpose. So it's, um, so yeah, so the first hires were like that. 
Now that we have started uh, trading a bit more, we are revenue generating, we have just uh, finished uh, raising our seed round. Now we will be able to afford to pay higher salaries. Uh, so we hope to be able to attract uh, more staff and you know, more qualified staff. But at the same time, you are losing that uh, fire and that um, love, let's say, of, uh, of everybody getting aligned and getting behind the goal. Well, for sure, I can imagine. And also it's a, you know, a complex process in the beginning of, uh, you know, putting together the team is really, really important. But then also like trying to expand is a totally different thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the team in the beginning is key. Uh, although I must say that the key in the beginning is the, is the founders, um, you know. So if if the if the dynamic between the founders isn't there, um, the business is doomed. Uh, it's uh, uh, the way I would characterize it is like um, uh, it's like not getting on with your partner and deciding to have a child. Uh, it's the same. It's exactly the same. I have two kids. Uh, I love them to bits. This is my fourth or fifth startup. So, you know, they are, uh, I love them all the same, much to my wife's uh, dismay. But this, this is it. So the, the issue is that uh, uh, it's like the child who will start crying in the middle of the night and you need to wake up and the next morning you need to go to work and uh, so on and so forth. Um, when you're starting a business, it's, it's exactly the same. You are totally devoted to it. So if you and your partner, the co-founder, if you have a co-founder, of course, if you and the co-founder is not fully aligned, that you're going to make the same sacrifices and push through, then this thing very quickly will start uh, falling apart. I can imagine. What would you say like, uh, are the biggest challenges for you of this startup uh, so far? Look, the, we, are, you know, we are coming to solve this problem that we have uh, identified and uh, you know we're we're hoping to solve um we're coming from from a from a real estate angle so we understand in, in, let's say from a business angle so we understand what banks want or we think we understand having worked uh, with them and for them we have a very good understanding of what insurance companies ha ha want so we're good with that so we we believe that we understand our client needs um, and we're quite good at dealing with clients, problem solving that, that part. What we're weak at is the tech side. And, and that's, that's uh, a big negative for our, for our company is that we do not have a tech founder, or sorry, a tech co-founder. That's our biggest disadvantage right now. So uh, we, have been, we have been very lucky that we have a, an interim CTO who has helped us a lot. Uh, but he's an interim CTO, so he's, they are temporary until we build the team. Now that we have pushed through and completed a year, a year and a bit of trading, as I mentioned, we have raised the seed round. So now we can start hiring and we have started hiring uh, the tech team. But in general, what we have done, I wouldn't advise it on anyone who is building a, a, a startup that is mainly focused on tech. How, uh, how was the, the funding process for you? Sure. So uh, in the beginning, we um, we put our own capital down. Uh, so we started um, uh, in my flat uh, here, where I'm uh, right now. Um, this is actually I was I was joking with my wife that this is the third company we started out of this flat. So we could turn it into an incubator at some point. But uh, yeah, so uh, we started from here. Um, uh, basically, we bootstrapped uh, uh, in the beginning for the first. Uh, uh, six seven months uh, we were not taking out a salary not that we are now but uh, you know we started uh, like that the people that we had in the beginning were people as I mentioned earlier who were um, you know one poor guy he 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 lost his uh, he had a start date he lost his job because of the pandemic um, so we we happened to I happened to bump into him and I said great you're starting tomorrow I grabbed him and we started like that. And other people the same. So sort of opportunistically, we just brought uh, you know, the, the, the first uh, couple of guys uh, on board and we put the whole thing together. Um, as I said, bootstrapping it uh, all the way. Um, in uh, April this year, so six, seven months in, um, after talking to a lot of people and you know, we had come up with the idea, we came up with a, a prototype of what we were trying to build in terms of the product. Uh, 
obviously we had no traction, but you know, we started having a plan. Uh, after meeting a lot of people, uh, we, we were, I think, uh, blessed and lucky that uh, we had a, uh, an insured tech, um, which is now 10 years in, out of Greece, who invested this, uh, in us. So they gave us a convertible loan. So that's, that would classify as pre-seed. Um, that gave us the time that we needed and the money that we needed to develop an MVP, a minimum viable product. Once that uh, was developed, uh, in uh, August uh, last year, so six, seven months ago. Uh, at the same time, end of August, beginning of September, we started uh, raising equity for, for seed uh, capital. It's taken us uh, six months. So we started, let's call it first September, and we finished uh, um, yesterday, effectively. So 20, what is it, the 23rd, 23rd of, uh, of February. So, uh, yeah, uh, this is sort of much even in terms of how it happened. Uh, usually the way you would do it is, uh, you know, you put your own money down in the beginning, you take no salary, okay? Same thing what we did this time. Then you are trying to do, and then effectively how you split your time, I mean, it depends on everyone how, what it is that they are doing is that you would go out and do work that you don't necessarily want to do. So, uh, you know, maybe you do... I mean, in our case, we do agency, we did valuations, we did inspections, we did uh, data cleansing. Basically, we did everything to generate an income to be able to cover expenses and pay as founders our obligation, obviously, first is to our staff, uh, always. So uh, you do random jobs basically to get uh, your costs covered. Uh, that, I would say, would, would, would uh, take up 60, 70% of our day in terms of uh, time. And the other 30%, you're actually slowly, slowly building uh, what you are hoping will be the next step of your business, right? So you're, you're sort of doing two things at the same time. Hopefully, what is going to happen is that you will survive long enough to have built the product or the business that you're trying to launch um, before you run out of money. Uh, so you, that's why you are stretching. That uh, That's why you do the 60% of the work, to stretch your money as much as you can. Um, and then you need to get some traction coming through, you know, uh, pick up the phone and call some people, uh, get some favors uh, in, um, ask people to catch to, you know, cut your, uh, cut your break, as they call it. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the key. I've seen a lot of people who what they do is that they, um, it's quite funny, either I've seen three mistakes, I think, uh, until now. One is they, uh, they have their job and they think they're going to have the startup on the, on the weekends. It doesn't happen, right? It doesn't happen. I mean, you, need to, you drop one to do the other. Uh, you, don't, you don't do both. The second is to say, I'm only going to do the startup and I'm going to do this my way and it's me against the world. Again, it's not going to work, right? So, uh, you know, the, the whole point of the startup is cash flow. So... Uh, you need to devote time to it. You need to come up with the idea. You need to nurture it and grow it and develop it and so on and so forth. Uh, so it needs time. Um, so yes, and because you don't have money in the beginning, you need to be doing random jobs left and right in order to, to, to buy the time that you need to build this thing up. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, that's really good advice to, to look out for, to not make those mistakes. Yeah, look, running out of money is the, is the key thing. I mean, usually what you find is... Uh, no. Most, most startups uh, fail, I would say, for three reasons. One, because the founders never uh, go out to sell what they have done. And I know it's very strange, but, you know, uh, without sales, you know, you are dead anyway. So that's sort of, but, but that's key, right? So they, they, they come to you and they say, I have built this beautiful thing. And you're like, amazing. Have you spoken to a client about whether they want it or not? No. Have you generated any revenue? No. Why? How do you know that this is needed? Well, it is. And you're like, no, but you haven't spoken to anyone. Just have an idea. So, uh, you know, the, the ideation phase or the ideation is coming up with the idea. But once you have come up with the idea, you need to go and talk to different people. But you need to talk to people who are going to tell you the truth back, not to your friends and family who, uh, you know, you are never, who are always going to lie to you. 
right? Their friends and family are always going to lie to you. So you need to go to people who don't know you or who uh, you feel comfortable enough to, exp to explain what it is that you're doing and you will get feedback. That's usually where I would say the vast majority fail. That's it. Then the second bit that they fail is that they think they need to develop the whole product first before going out and trying to get some revenue. So after you have the feedback, they think you need to spend all the money to build it. We have been trading for a year and a half. Our product isn't done yet. We haven't even launched it a year and a half in. And the reason is that we build something, we go out, they tell us, yeah, but we want this, 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 and change. Okay, we go back, we come back again, we changed it, we go to somebody. So the, you know, the, there will be many iterations of the product, of the end product. So to go and spend all of your money to build what you think is going to be the end product. And then when you finish and you are right, okay, I'm out of money now, but I have it and I'm ready to sell. Usually that's the point you're going to fail because actually the client doesn't actually want what you, what you think you wanted. That's usually the second, the second bit. So, and then the third is you need some uh, credentials. You need somebody who is going to use your product, whom um, the name of that company, let's say you're dealing with B2B clients. So you want some key names uh, to have on your, let's call it on your resume on people who have used it. So that's the point. Uh, it's at that point in time where you need to pick up the phone and call everyone, literally everyone that you know. Go through your phone, call everyone that you know. Go on LinkedIn, everyone that you know. Uh, right? This is what I did. Right? You call and you say, hey, uh, I'm Pavlos. I started doing this thing. One line, by the way. Cannot be more. Uh, I'd really appreciate if you had a minute. Uh, can we have a call? Fine. And then I would call people and say, look, can I work for you for free? Right? Because, because what you want is you want to work with them, not for them to see your product and then buy it necessarily. You want to work with them to see how they are using your product. So it's like a, a next level of feedback. How they are using your product, does this work and no, so on and so forth. Plus, because you've done a project with them, not only is your product better and you more experienced, you can use that credential, right? The fact that you've done that project when the time comes to go to the next client. So in the beginning, you need to call in favors to get these credentials, to get these badges, so mm -hmm. that when the time comes, I don't know, client number 10, you're like, okay, no more doing it for free. Now I need to charge. Uh, you can try and say, by the way, I've done these 10 projects. These guys have used it. They are happy with it, whatever. Uh, you know, this is how, I, how much I want to be able to offer you this advice or this product or whatever it is that you're developing or building. Okay, oh, that's very good. So it's like, in a way, collecting data of your, uh, of your startup. Yeah, yeah. You, you need somebody to vouch for you because if you, if you flip it around to whomever your client is, how do we buy, right? I mean, think about the buyer. If, if, if I'm a retail person, Let's, the classic example is this. You have to, is, uh, is this example where at the end of the road, uh, there is a lake and there are two restaurants, identical. In the one restaurant, there is a person sitting and having lunch. And in the other, there is no one. The first person who will come, most likely they will go to the restaurant where there is somebody there already eating because they don't want to be alone. The next person will do the same. So what you will end up with is one restaurant having all the people and the other one being empty. As individuals, we, we buy from, and we, are, we gravitate where others have vouched before. Now, think about, you know, it's, it's like Google reviews or TripAdvisor or anything you have. The more, the more stars, the more reviews, the more likely you, you are to, to buy from them. Uh, you know, this, is, this is sort of similar. So uh, you, know, you need these badges uh for for the new guys to trust you to buy from you exactly because you are the startup because their problem is if you are doing b2c you know the, your retail client will want to know how many others have bought so their reviews matter your publicity matters your social media and so on and so forth matters and if you are b2b it's even harder in many ways because the person who is going to make the decision to, to hire your services, whatever those are, if for whatever reason you do not deliver, 
they are the ones who are in trouble with their boss. So that, you know, if something goes wrong, what is going to happen? The boss is going to turn to them and say, okay, what choices did you have in front of you? And you pick the startup, mm -hmm. right? So at that point in time, you need to be in a position to have the information to give to this person, to give to their boss, to say, look, these guys came to me. They had done the project for X, Y, Z. So I hired them. I picked the startup over somebody more established because they had this track record. Okay. This is how, uh, this is it. You're, you almost need to always think, uh, put yourself in the client's position rather than, uh, you know, I'm selling, you should be buying from me. It's like, yeah, you're selling, they should be buying, but what are they thinking when they are buying from you rather than what you think that they, uh, they think uh, or should be thinking when they're buying from you? Mm, okay. Well, that's very, very good uh, advice. And also to go down to the, to the very practical examples of, uh, okay, how, this is how you should do it. Because just saying, okay, do the research on, uh, on the market first. And it's, you know, yeah, very good advice. It's very good to have the, the specifics that you just provided. So that's great. Uh, research, if I may, uh, research, especially when it comes to innovative things, is uh, totally irrelevant. Uh, I know this is uh, very strange, but if what you are building is actually innovative, first of all, I would say that you are delusional. Right, so uh, there is nothing innovative about anything in this world, right? Unless you are, I don't know, somebody out there super smart, whatever that you have figured out something crazy, most probably what you are doing, either somebody has thought about it before or somebody in another part of the world has thought about it or there are 50 things that are very similar to what you are doing. This is sort of step number one. At the second, so step one, find your competitors because there are plenty. Step two, so that will give you a sense of the market and the market research. Step two, however, when you go out and do market research yourself and you say to your client, if we had this, would you buy it? Right? So in, a, in an abstract way, mm. it, it doesn't work because you are asking the client to answer a question about something they don't understand. Imagine if uh, Henry Ford Right. If, the, if, if the people who made the first cars for everyone, imagine if they went out to people and they said to them, what improvements in the means of transport would you have like, would you like to have? Ah, more horses. <laughs> because that's what they know. <laughs> that is what they know. So the moment you, so number one, if you are innovating, probably you are not. You are improving, so find those people. And then second, when you go out and ask the question, it, 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 you need to be a bit careful how you ask the question and how much reliance you put on it. Because if indeed what you are doing is a bit innovative and a bit different than a bit whatever, people are going to have a hard time understanding this link uh, you know, between the horses and the car and what you're trying to do and so on and so forth. Um, and that's where for me research is, I'm always a bit uh, skeptical. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why it's better to test by doing, create a prototype, go out, sell it, give it to people, but you know, ha have it there, they need to see it. Um, fail, and again, fail, and again. Okay, so it's like a, uh, I don't it's know. A feedback, it's a feedback loop. You oh. need to keep failing. You need to keep failing. We had a, uh, because how, how do I, how do you know? I mean, it, it's like I come to you and say, you know, do you like, um, I don't know, Ethiopian cuisine? Well, if you never had, uh, you know, how do you know? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Okay. So I need to give you something to eat. Uh, I need to give you one dish. Maybe you like that. Then I need to give you a second one, third one. And try a few people. This is sort of the point. This is this is this is it. The same with products. You create, a, you make a website. Uh, you you test it if people are coming. You see the user interface, what people like, what people don't like, what they don't like. You fix it again and again and again and again. That's why you see. I mean, even bigger brands do it. If you think about it, um, you know, nothing stays the same. You you just need to keep changing and evolving with the people. 
this is it also uh, startup is pretty much the same you, you you have an idea you think you have answer, an answer to a problem and you keep trying to figure out what that problem uh, what that solution looks like for your client as you said uh, you don't know the answer of, of a question when it's too too abstract and uh, yeah. not clear enough the, the thing that i would suggest also is uh and um, picking up the phone and talking to people mm. it's amazing how many people um how many people who you think are going to help you will not um and how many people who you don't even know who will help you it is the two extremes the people who are closest to you usually they will tell you either um what you are doing is crazy you should stay at your job or they will tell you um what you are doing is great i have every faith in you full stop faith is nice right clients even better but they are not willing to help you with that um whilst other people random people that you have never met in your life if you reach out to them and social media is uh, especially uh, the more professional platforms like linkedin uh, compared to anything else if you send an email to someone um again my experience has uh, has shown until now uh, that they will reply back you have nothing to lose right two three lines you know do you have a minute to uh, you know i have something to talk to you about i have this idea whatever just be very open you know i'm starting my business i'm looking i was looking at your website i like what you do i have a question right and and a lot of people are are, are more than happy to help um you can, you know i mean uh, if you read the, that book uh, the famous book uh, caldini by caldini uh, influence which talks about uh, you know how, how different people can influence others basically when you ask for help the fact that you are putting yourself in a vulnerable position encourages the other the other party to become more giving towards you this is it the moment if somebody emails you and says uh, you know i'm a young uh, i don't know uh, i'm a university graduate out of slovakia and i'm thinking about uh, you know uh, doing um, this uh, product uh, do you have five minutes 10 minutes to have a chat whenever you can why not why wouldn't you get on a phone with them and have a quick call exactly just uh, it's a very very little time that you set aside but it can have great great consequences yeah it comes there it's been a real pleasure talking to you today i just wanted before we wrap up is there anything you would like to add that you uh, feel like uh, you, we cannot go without uh look i think what the uh... It's a uh, it's a beautiful uh, world out there, you know this uh, startup world. Uh, I've, I've been involved in this in the last uh, 15 years, more, four, uh, yeah, 17 years now. So setting up different companies, selling them, uh, some going bust, but uh, you know, uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The only thing I can say is that is it's a lot of fun. Uh, setting up a startup, trying to run it, you uh, the amount of experience that somebody gets out of it is is incredible. Uh, in terms of personal growth, in terms in terms of meeting people, developing new skills is great. Um, I would encourage everyone to to get involved in some way or another, uh, exactly because of the of how much they will learn uh, from this experience. And I think that increasingly, as uh, in this crazy world that is becoming, uh, you know, it's sort of pulling itself apart but bringing itself together at the same time. Through the internet and work from home and everything, the whole idea of, of collaboration, especially on cross borders, uh, is becoming more and more important. So, so yeah, and everybody is out there to help you guys. Uh, usually, not the ones that you expect. That's a very good note to end on. That the person that you least expect to help you will be there to to make uh, wonders for you. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you. Thank you for your time. To join the six-week program, register on the website until the 28th of February. Go to thestartupuniverse.org.
Make sure to follow us on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and on TikTok. Please like and subscribe in order to get notified for our next episode on YouTube or on the podcast platforms. Thank you for listening.